Part Eight of Works of Solace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Works of Gaius Celestius Crispus. Translated by Alfred W. Pollard. Catiline Conspiracy, Part Six. On Cato resuming his seat, all the men of consular rank, together with many other members of the Senate, commended his proposal and praised his courage to the skies. Reproaching each other for what they now called their timidity, they accounted Cato a great and brilliant statesman, and a decree of the Senate was passed in the words of his resolution. I have read and heard much of the noble deeds of the Roman people in peace and in war, on land and on sea, and chance has disposed me to consider what circumstance it was that had done most to support it in its gigantic task. I was aware that on many occasions it had confronted large bodies of the enemy with but a handful of troops. I knew of the wars which Rome, with her scanty resources, had waged against wealthy kings. I knew, too, that she had often had to bear the rude attack of fortune, and that in eloquence the Greek, in warlike renown the Gaul, had outstripped her children. After much reflection, however, I arrived at the conclusion that it was the preeminent merit of a few of our citizens that had accomplished all, that this was the power that had enabled poverty to subdue wealth, a handful to rout a host. When, however, the state was corrupted by luxury and indolence, the republic, in its turn, by its very greatness, lent strength to its blundering generals and magistrates, while, as if the vigor of their fathers had perished, at many periods there was not a single man in Rome of conspicuous merit. In my own time, however, there have been two men of surpassing merit, though different character, Marcus Cato and Gaius Caesar. As my subject has brought them into notice, it is not my design to pass them over without disclosing their respective natures and characters, so far as my ability will allow me. In birth, age, and eloquence, Caesar and Cato were nearly equal, and they were well matched in the loftiness of their aims, and in the renown which, each in his own way, they attained. Caesar was esteemed for his kind offices and munificence, Cato for the strict uprightness of his life. The former was distinguished by his clemency and compassion. Sternness added dignity to the latter. Caesar won renown by his readiness to give, to help, and to pardon. Cato by never offering a bribe. The one was the refuge of the wretched, the other the destruction of the bad. The former was praised for his affability, the latter for his consistency. In fine, Caesar had formed the resolve to work, to be ever on the watch, to promote his friend's interests even to the detriment of his own, and to refuse nothing which was worth the giving. He aimed at a high command, an army, a war in some new field where his talents might be displayed. Cato, on the other hand, made temperance, dignity, and above all, austerity of behavior his pursuit. He did not vie in wealth with the wealthy, nor in intrigue with the intriguer, but in courage with the man of action, in honor with the scrupulous, in self-restraint with the upright. He preferred to be good rather than to seem so, and thus, the less he pursued renown, the more it attended him. When, as I related, the Senate had passed Cato's resolution, the consul, thinking it better to forestall the coming night, lest the interval should be used for any revolutionary movement, ordered the officers to make the necessary preparations for the execution. After posting guards at various points, he personally conducted Lentulus to the prison, while the praetors did the same to the rest. In the prison there is a place, called the Tullianum, which, after a slight ascent to the left, you find sunk about twelve feet in the ground. It is guarded on every side by walls, and above it is an arched roof of stone. Desolate, darkness, and stench give it a loathsome and dreadful appearance. To this place Lentulus was conducted, and there strangled by the appointed executioners. A patrician of the illustrious house of the Cornelii, and a man who had held the office of consul at Rome, he met an end worthy of his character and his crimes. On Cethegus, Statilius, Gabinius, and Saperius, the same punishment was inflicted. While this was happening at Rome, Catiline, from the whole force made up of his own contingent and of the original army of Manlius, organized two legions, and filled up the cohorts in proportion to the number of his men. 
afterwards as volunteers or members of the conspiracy arrived in the camp they were drafted in equal numbers into several divisions and in a short time he had raised his legions to their proper strength although at first he had not more than two thousand men not more than a quarter however of his whole force was equipped with weapons of war the rest as chance had armed them carried hunting spears or javelins and in some cases pointed stakes on the approach of antonius with his army catiline moved to and fro among the mountains frequently changed his quarters turning now towards rome now towards gaul and offered the enemy no chance of fighting for he hoped should his accomplices at rome succeed in their plans soon to be at the head of large forces meanwhile he rejected the slave bands which at the outset rallied round him in large numbers he trusted to the strength of the conspiracy and at the same time thought it prejudicial to his designs to appear to have made the cause of citizens one with that of runaway slaves on the arrival at the camp of the news that at rome the plot was discovered and that lentulus cethegus and the others whom i had named above had been executed many who had been attracted by the hope of plunder or desire for revolution now deserted the rest catiline led by forced marches over rugged mountains to the district of pistoria intending to retreat secretly by crossroads into transalpine gaul quintus metellus cellar however was stationed in Picinium with three legions and surmised that catiline in his present difficulty would be adopting the very course i have described learning the latter's route from deserters he hastily advanced and pitched his camp at the very foot of the mountains which catiline would have to descend on his hasty march towards gaul antonius also was close upon him his army was large but it was aided by the more level character of its road and he could thus follow in pursuit catiline now saw himself hemmed in between the mountains and the forces of the enemy in the capital he had been defeated and he had no hope either of escape or refuge he thought best therefore in so perilous a case to try the fortune of war and determined to come to an instant engagement with antonius accordingly he called his troops round him and spoke as follows soldiers i have long discovered that words cannot inspire courage and that no speech of a general can give a flagging army energy or the timid courage just as so much daring natural or acquired as resides in each man's breast does he display in war the man insensible to the call of glory and danger you will harangue in vain his cowardice stops his ears nevertheless i have called you together to give you a few words of advice and at the same time to disclose the motive of my resolution i make certain soldiers that you know of the disastrous consequences to himself and to us of the cowardice and indolence of lentulus and how while awaiting reinforcements from the capital i have been prevented from marching towards gaul you know too as well as i do our present position two hostile armies close our path the one on the side of rome the other of gaul want of corn and other necessaries forbid us to remain longer in our present quarters desire it though we may in whatever direction we determine to march we must cut our way with our swords i exhort you therefore to keep a brave and ready heart and when you enter battle to remember that in your own right hands lies wealth honor and fame as well as your freedom and the possession of your country if we conquer our safety will be secured we shall have provisions in plenty and the gates of boroughs and colonies will be thrown open to us if we give way in fear we shall have all these against us no place nor friend will protect the man who has failed to protect himself with his own arms moreover soldiers we and our enemies will be fighting under motives of very different force for us the contest is for country for freedom and for life while our enemies can have little interest in fighting to maintain the supremacy of a narrow class let these thoughts inspire you with hardihood advance to the fight mindful of your ancient valor you might though to your deep disgrace have passed your lives in exile some of you might after the confiscation of your goods have lingered in rome on the watch for a stranger's bounty such courses seem shameful and unbearable to men of spirit and so you have chosen to follow the one that has led you here if you would now quit it you must use your daring for it is at the discretion of the victor that war is changed for peace to hope for safety in flight when your backs unprotected by armor are turned to the enemy is indeed folly in a battle it is always the greatest cowards who run the greatest risks while courage is as a wall of defense 
when i look on you soldiers and count up your achievements i am possessed with a high hope of victory your resolution your age and your courage and above all the inevitable nature of the encounter which often makes even the timid brave exhort me to this and the narrowness of the position prevents our being surrounded by the host of the enemy if however fortune shows herself jealous of your valor see that you do not fall unavenged nor prefer by a surrender to be butchered like sheep rather than to fight like men and leave your enemies a bloody victory that shall cost them dear at the end of this speech after a trifling delay he ordered the signal to sound and led his troops in orderly array down to the level ground he then sent away the horses of all who owned them in order that the soldiers might be encouraged by the sense that their danger was shared by all alike he himself on foot drew up his army with due regard to the nature of the ground and his own numbers the plain lay between mountains on the left and a rugged line of rocks on the right here he posted eight cohorts to form the front while the other divisions with their standards were stationed in closer order as a reserve from these cohorts he withdrew all the picked and veteran centurions with the bravest and best armed of the common soldiers and added them to the front he ordered gaius manlius to take the command on the right and a certain man of Faisale on the left he himself with his own freedmen and some soldier servants took up his station by his eagle one it was said which gaius maurius used in his army in the cimbrian war on the other side gaius antonius was prevented by lameness from taking part in the battle and entrusted his army to his lieutenant marcus petreus by him the veteran cohorts which he had levied to suppress the revolt were posted in front and the rest of the army behind them as a reserve petreus himself reviewed his army on horseback accosting the soldiers by name encouraging them and entreating them to remember that they were fighting against half-armed brigands for their country and children their altars and homes he was an experienced soldier and during a career of more than thirty years in the army in which he had filled the offices of tribune prefect legate and praetor with great distinction he had gained a knowledge of many of his men and their brave deeds and by reference to these he now kindled their spirits when he had satisfied himself on every point petreus sounded the signal and ordered the cohorts to advance slowly and the same movement was made by the enemy on reaching a distance at which the light troops could engage the two armies raised a great shout and charged each other standard to standard dropping their javelins they fought with swords the veterans remembering their ancient valor pressed on to engage at close quarters their opponents fiercely withstood them and the conflict raged with the greatest fury meanwhile catiline with his light troops was busy in the front he relieved the hard-pressed called up fresh men to fill the places of the wounded had an eye for every need often fought himself and often struck down his man in fine he played the part at once of an active soldier and a skilful general petreus on seeing catiline making such vigorous and unexpected exertions led the cohort of his guards against the enemy's centre their ranks were now in confusion and they could only offer a straggling resistance he cut them down and proceeded to attack the survivors on either flank manlius and the Faisalin fell fighting in the front rank and catiline saw that his troops were routed and only himself and a few others left he remembered his race and the rank he had once held and rushing into the thickest of the foe fought on till he was pierced with wounds it was only after the battle was decided that it could be fully seen with what daring and resolution catiline's army had been inspired almost the exact position which each had taken up while living he now in death covered with his body a few of those in the centre who had been dislodged by the praetor's bodyguard had fallen less closely together in the different places where they had made a stand but all bore their wounds in front catiline however was found at a distance from his own men among the enemy's dead he continued to breathe for a short time and retained on his countenance that savage courage which had marked him in life i should not forget to mention that out of all that host not a single free-born man was made prisoner either in the battle or the rout so unsparing had all been alike of their own and their enemies lives nor was the victory of the national army either happy or bloodless its bravest soldiers had perished in the fight or came out of it badly wounded many too who had come from the camp out of curiosity or for the sake of plunder in turning over the bodies of the enemy found some a friend others those bound to them by the ties of hospitality or blood while others recognized the features of an enemy 
thus throughout the whole army grief and gladness sorrow and rejoicing held divided sway end of catiline conspiracy